Hi, Rosie. Hi. Um, we actually know each other from few years back, so it's great seeing you again. Um, I'm happy to be here interviewing you regarding your book. Um, I wanted to ask you a few questions um, regarding it. First of all, what motivated you to finally tell the details of what you went through in a book? I found out and I saw that um, our silence is their biggest weapon. They, the abusers, any type of abuser, whether it's sexual or domestic, um, the, the more quiet you are, the more advantage they take of the situation. So by the time I was healed, um, at about 25, I started speaking on the topic everywhere. I mean, everywhere where people would hear me. Um, but in 2012, I said, you know what? I'm 100% healed. Why? Because I have a, a normal relationship now. I have a healthy, normal marriage. Um, so I said, I, I have to do something about what's going on. It's, it's literally my purpose in life. And I really want to change the statistic that one in four of girls that's abused, I want to change that. And I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm thinking if we raise consciousness, if we, if more girls start making police reports, pedophiles are going to be scared. I want them to be scared. I want them to say that crazy girl Rosie is ruining my plan. That's what I want. Okay. And who would you say that this book was written for? Women in general or women that have been abused? Mm, more than anything, women that have gone through any type of abuse. Not only sexual. Um, some women that have read my story have never been through this, but they find themselves in, oh, well, I have been in a toxic relationship or... I, I do have maybe some dad issues or um, I have been obese. I mean, I just talk about everything to make it wide range and it's very detailed to bring up the emotions so that they can reflect on their own life. You know, even speaking about my sister's death, part of putting it in there, which is a, um, something that I haven't shared with the world, was so that people can say, if there's hope even after death, there has to be hope for my marriage, for my issues with my children for my um, issues even at my, my job. Was writing a book something in the works that you had been thinking about for a while or was that something, because I know you commented saying that you want to help the women and was it always your plan to write a book or was it just maybe with the foundation or along with your sister um, or was a book always in your mind? I'm an avid reader and when I was being sexually abused, I would um, freeze up and close my eyes and just go into a story I was reading at the time and I became the character and that really helped me um, go through those years of actual abuse. I never even thought of telling this story for nine years. I was just like, I swore to myself never to speak. But when I turned 25 and I was finally healthy and I started speaking, um, I saw how proud my sister was. I mean, she had told me when I was 16, you know, you should speak about it. And I'm like, you're nuts, dude. What am I going to tell the world? And this is a sad story. And really, who cares about Rosie Rivera? But she started showing me it's really not about you. This is about everyone, you know? So when I started speaking on the, to the topic, I would see girls, their eyes just change in front of me. They would just be like, oh my God, like what? I'm loved? And um, I just started speaking on it. And for nine years, I've been doing that. And in 2012, I said, you know what? I think I think Che had it right. I think Che knew what she was talking about. She always did, darn it. Um, <laughs> so I said I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and do it, and and she backed me up. And I think her being so proud of me. I mean, she was filling up the Staples Center and and other huge auditoriums, and I was speaking in front of 200 people. But she respected me as if the roles were reversed. She just thought I was doing the most amazing job with my life. So. Um, I stopped the project in, when she passed away and I started it again um, in 2014 thinking I still got to do something. I still got to help someone in the world. Okay. And was it hard to write this book? Was it because you had to relive some of the details? What do you, did you find that it was hard or did you find that it was in a sense relieving? It was more relieving actually. I, I was already healed from the sexual abuse and what I did because I'm a speaker, I spoke it out and we recorded everything and then we put it, we, we made it into a book. So that mm -hmm. sentence, it was easy because I had already done it for nine years, but the chapters that are most difficult um, is chapter 15 and on when I speak about my sister because I'm not healed yet. I'm in the process of. Mm -hmm. So to, to relive all that in detail, um, to even edit it and translate it was super duper hard. And not only that part, but when you go back into your story and I could see how my pain had affected my family, how my father lost his daughter in a sense, how my brothers lost their little sister, and how I was so disrespectful to my mother 
that's when I would cry when I'd be like I can't believe you know my poor dad like you know so um, but it was also relieving to say well I'm glad I know it now so I could rebuild my relationship with my father so that I can show my mother my mother that I honor her so even then there was hope and then when you see your life like written and you you're like this is my life if I've been through this dude I can face anything so it made me a little motivational um, as well. yeah Okay, and um, what other projects are you currently working on that kind of go hand in hand with the book? I know you were commenting about your foundation, I believe. Yes, so I have Sister Somalia. I've started that um, because I've met people all over the world that have gone through similar things and they have a gift for hearing and giving advice because they've been through it, you know, this is, and even if they've been through different things and we help each woman in each country and each city find resources for herself. So it's all through emails and WhatsApp and you ask for help and you start speaking up and then we say, okay, well, you know what, what I'm seeing is, is that you can go to this shelter or you can go to this resource center that'll give you um, low cost counseling. Um, so that's what we're doing and that's what I dream of really to open up a, a not, a, not necessarily a shelter because my sister's doing that, but like a resource center that gives counseling 100% for free for the victim, for the parents, for the future children, everything. And um, other than that, I do rosyrivera.com. I'm, I'm working on becoming a, a real vlogger where I make videos and I speak about everything. Not a, hard topics like this, but also lighthearted topics like fashion and family and communication with your kids. You know, so I, I think whatever I have inside, I want to give it. And, you know, vlogging is the best way. And I know that you're really close, just like your sister, to the fans. Um, you know, they can, they feel very identified with you. What is a way besides social media that maybe the fans can contact you, a woman can contact you if they're ever going through a certain situation, if they ever need, if they feel identified, like you said, um, with what they, what, what you went through, how would they be able to contact you through your blog? Yes, through my blog, right there on my email, on my, uh, .com, I have a contact at rosarivera.com. And whenever I get a little time, I start answering some of those emails. Um, Instagram is the best way, a DM, uh, I'll usually look at it. But if not, for sure, sistersomalia at gmail.com. Okay. And um, one last question that um, I've been wanting to ask you for a while, because um, I know that when we, we knew each other back in LA, um, you weren't really involved in all of this. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, when your sister passed away, you pretty much had to take over everything was it overwhelming there were moments when it was i did not want this uh, i think you would know yeah. at work i was just like i wouldn't <laughs> even mention being a rivera i was a normal adjuster just trying to meet my quota yeah was, that's how i was in life you know i i really hid from all the media it was very difficult i have to be honest i was even mad at god um one day I was jogging through the park and one of my sister's fans, and I love them, but you know, I also wanted my alone time and I wasn't ready for this and I didn't plan this, but I was jogging, dude. It's the only 30 <laughs> minutes you have to yourself and a fan starts chasing after me and I'm like, dude, are you serious? Like, can I just have five minutes of peace? And poor lady, you know, I'm sorry. I was out, you know, um, you know, I guess she understands now, but I hope that you understand that I lost my sister and my privacy and my own life. Yeah. So that same day, like I'm jogging and I'm like, dude, I'm so mad at you, God. And he's like, good, I'm glad you finally said it. Now, do you want to do anything about mm -hmm. it? Like, Because I realized I was only being frustrated. All 2013, I lived frustrated and angry, fighting my own destiny. Without me wanting it to be, this is my destiny. And I see that now through through my broken pieces, my life, I was planned for this moment. I hated my hard character, but now I see that when you're in a meeting and you're negotiating, you have to have a strong character to say no. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, I'm gonna make it work now. So I think in a way I was prepared for a moment like this. Okay, thank you.